Today we're talking about the windmill tactic in chess. Now this is one of the coolest tactics in my opinion because of how you get to just take a bunch of pieces and your opponent really can't do anything. So usually the important thing about the windmill tactic is that you have a bishop and a rook most of the time. It could happen, I guess, with a queen and a rook as well, but usually it's a bishop and a rook, and the bishop is lined up on the king, and the rook is in between, something like this, okay? And the way the windmill tactic works is you move the rook away. In this position, I would take this pawn. It creates a check on the opponent's king. They have only usually only one option, and then you just go back, and they have to go back in the corner, and you get the same exact position, except you just took a pawn for free. And then you could, in theory, if you wanted to, just do the same thing. You take the bishop with check, and the king has to go back, and you come back. And then they have to go to the corner, and guess what? It's your turn again. And you know what? I'm just going to keep taking stuff, right? Because what can black do? Check. And I'm just going to keep taking stuff. And you can actually take everything on the, the sec seventh rank, which is pretty funny, right? And black just has to go back and forth. And I could have checkmated it actually sooner. This is just checkmate. So in this position, I didn't have to do that. But I wanted to illustrate the point that it's pretty cool, right? Black literally can't do anything. Now, this was a made-up position where I put the pieces perfectly for this to work out, you know, in white's favor. But what you're going to see is that even in real games, the same concept can apply. So let's take a look at another example from an actual game. It's white to play. What do you think white should play given what we've already talked about? All right, well, if you had a chance to look at that, the move is rook takes g7, check. And then when the king goes over, notice we have the same type of setup that I was talking about. You've got the bishop lined up on the king with the rook in between. And now it's a question of where should we move the rook to? And in this case, the best move is rook to g5, creating the attack on the queen. Now, you might be saying, well, why don't we, you know, take all of the pawns, sorry, take all the pawns like you mentioned, and then go and do that, right? Which is a good idea. However... In this example, if we go here, black has knight to e5. It blocks off the bishop. Our fun is over, and we actually are just going to lose. So this is an important point. Sometimes you, you have more freedom with where you can move the rook to because of the position, and sometimes you can't. This is one of those situations where we have to be you know bear in mind that this knight can block our bishop. So because of that, this is an example where we only really have one chance to move the rook because the knight's gonna block. So we have to make the most of it in this case, which is why we go to g5 so we can get the queen. If black were to play this, we simply take the queen and we're, we're winning. So keep that in mind, depending on the position, you may or may not have multiple chances to do it. Sometimes you only have one. Okay, let's go to the next example. It's black to play, what move should black play? And what's the follow-up? Well, the first move I'm gonna go ahead and assume everybody can see, we take here and the king goes to the corner. Now it's a question of, what is the follow-up? So I'll let you pause right here. What should we play as black? All right, well, this one is a little bit tricky because it almost looks like if we just slide the rook back somewhere, let's just say here, it's checkmate because the king can't move. However, white has F3, they block it, they they you know basically get out of trouble. That's not what we need to do. In this case, we take here first, check, get rid of the pawn, then we go back, right? using this idea of repeating the position, except now we've removed the pawn, and now we can move the rook, let's just say, to g4, and guess what? There's no more pawn, and now white has to give up the rook, and it's checkmate, okay? So that was a subtle detail, but we did need to take the pawn. That was important, okay? Let's go to the next one. All right, so the black to play and win, and uh, if, even if you see the first move, try to see all the way through and calculate all the variations to the end to see the final puzzle for this one. All right, well, if you had a chance to look at that, so of course we're going to start with the rook check, pushes the king in the corner, and again, we're going to get rid of that pawn, because this is pretty common. A lot of times the f3 pawn will block our bishop if we don't take it right away. So we take it right away, force the king back, go back to g2, and then a lot of times once you get rid of that f pawn in situations like this, you just simply drop the rook back, because now they have no way to, to block it. You want the rook to take away the the g1 square in this case, because it's simply checkmate. In other situations, you might go for the, you know, taking all of these along the, se the, the second rank, but you do have to be careful because it does give white the option, like in this case, to sacrifice their rook, and we no longer have checkmate because now the king can actually escape. Okay, so even though it kind of looked good, like we're going to get some pieces, which it kind of was, checkmate is better. And in this case, the only way to get checkmate was to go back here. 
and force this to happen, right? So keep that in mind. Even though it's kind of a simple tactic, there are some subtle things that, you know, you have to be aware of. All right, let's go to the next one. White to play. What should you play? And try to calculate through the entire, uh, the entire line if you can. All right, well, if you had a chance to do that, this one, again, we take with the rook. And even though there's no rook sitting there to stop the king, we actually have this knight. And so it's kind of the same type of thing. It looks a little bit different, but it's the same concept. The king has to go over. What do we want to get rid of a lot of the times first? That F pawn, right? If we try to go back here for checkmate, the black would just block. And it's going to be much more difficult for us. So we want to take that first, force the king over, go back. And then we can deliver the checkmate by moving the rook really anywhere that we want to. And once the bishop blocks, we simply take it and we have a nice little checkmate. Okay. Okay. Let's go to another one. Black to play. Again, try to calculate the whole line out in your head before you look at the solution. All right. Well, if you had a chance to do that, of course, we're going to take here first with check. King has to go in the corner. And again, this is kind of the same deal. We don't want to allow the pawn to block us. Okay. So we take it first. King has to go back. We go to G2 check, king goes here, and here is where it's a little bit tricky because you might have been tempted to say, well, I guess we just take all the pawns. The problem with that is white has the option of rook to F3 because the queen is defending and the windmill is over, the bishop has been blocked, and we're going to actually lose now. The best we can do is take this, the game goes on, we're, we're down a queen for a rook. So in this case, this is one of those examples where we kind of only had one more opportunity after we took the F pawn to do something else. So it's a little bit tricky, but what we need to do is play rook to g3 check. And this is a key move because it's almost checkmate, but rook to f3 white stops. Why do we have to go to g3? Well, we needed to be able to attack that square. So now when we take this with our bishop, it's defended by the rook and the king is stuck. White has to give up the queen and we come out uh, you know, up a rook into a winning end game. So that one was a little bit more tricky there. Uh, hopefully you saw that now. The last three positions I'm going to share with you are much more difficult. Okay, so we're going to start off with this one right here. It's white to play and win. Same kind of concept, but there's a bit more going on in this position. So go ahead and pause, try to see through what we need to do, and then we'll talk about this one. All right, if you had a chance to look at that one, this one is tricky because when you first look at this, you might not even think that it's a windmill tactic, right? It's like, where, where's the windmill at exactly? So you, you needed to sacrifice the queen to lure the king out, and it steps in line with this discovered check. So we get to choose where do we want to move our bishop, and it's going to put the king in check. Now, some of you might have been tempted to say, well, we just go back check and attack the queen we're going to win black's queen the problem with this is we just sacrificed our queen and so black can just make a random move like here and yes we take the queen but then the rook comes down we're kind of even material wise but black's just in a better position this knight is really strong the king is coming to the center to help out the rook is very active this is actually losing for us okay so it's not good enough the other thing that you might have noticed is that maybe we can go somewhere like let's just say e7 hoping that the king might go back into the corner. There's a problem here, though, and that's the king's going to come over, and even though we have a check, it's not checkmate because they take our bishop, okay? And, of course, we can't go to f6, or the king takes. If we go to h4, black's going to play the move king to h6 because now we don't have a checkmate over here, which we would have had. So, for example, if we move the bishop... Uh, well, let me just tell you, the correct move is bishop to d8, and then we'll explain a little bit why. So bishop d8, if the king goes here, we have checkmate, okay? So now you can see why h4 doesn't accomplish the same thing. Um, e7, I talked about how the king can capture. We need to keep the bishop on this diagonal, because if we try to go, let's just say, to f4, then the king can actually escape on f6, and it's going to kind of have lots of options to get away. So very tricky follow-up here to the queen sacrifice of where do we move the bishop to, right? And this is... Uh, where they can become more difficult. But this is ultimately uh, forces the king to go back in the corner because now if the king goes to f7, this is just simply checkmate because the bishop is not going to get captured, right? We looked at that before. So that's a cool checkmate. So because of that, black is obligated to go to h8. And again, it's kind of like, okay, where's the windmill, Nelson? So if you want to pause now and see if you can figure out how do we set up a windmill from this position? All right, well, if you had a chance to do that, so the windmill, the bishop has to deliver the check, obviously, and there has to be a rook here somehow, right? But we can't put our bishop there 
or the rook just takes us. So how do we do that? Well, we got to lure the rook away. So we play rook to g8. The rook captures. And then we can go bishop f6 check. And now you're probably starting to see the pattern. The rook goes here. And you might say, oh, we take it with the rook, right? The problem with that is it's black's turn. We don't get a chance to deliver the checkmate. Because black says, thank you very much, uh, checkmate. So in this case, we had to take with the bishop to create the discover check here take the knight and once the king moves take the queen and now we're in a winning end game because we have the extra bishop so that was a much more complicated one congratulations if you did see all the way through that there was a lot going on there so don't feel bad if you missed that one okay but i wanted to show you how that windmill idea can show up even in in positions where it doesn't seem like it's it's possible okay Let's go to the next position. Now, the last two positions, okay, including this one right here, are from famous games. Okay, This one was from, uh, I believe, Tory versus Lasker. So Lasker was playing as black. Now, Lasker was one of the, the greatest chess players of his era. But he's playing black. Looks like a pretty solid position. But white does have an attack. There's a rook, a queen, and a bishop. And white has a killer move here uh, that takes advantage of the windmill tactic. So if you would like to find what Tory played here, go ahead and pause. All right, well, if you had a chance to do that, the amazing move here was bishop to f6. Now, why is it such an amazing move? Well, primarily because the queen is under attack and is not being defended. So he's sacrificing his queen. Okay, so when black takes, why did he do that? Well, it's because he wanted to set up the windmill. Rook takes g7. King has to go in the corner. This is a very common situation, right? We've seen this before. What do you think he did next? That's right. Rook takes f7, check. Then he went rook to g7, and notice he can just take everything. So he comes over here, he takes the bishop, he comes back. And he actually decided to not take the pawn. I think he didn't want to unleash the rook. And he decided, okay, I've taken as many pieces as I can, the pawn and the bishop. Now I'll come back to g5 and get the queen. And he, he not only got his queen back, but he also took this pawn and this bishop in the process. Right. So you can see why it was a very brilliant idea, and he went on to win this game. Okay, so that's one. And let's look at one more. Here we go. This was a game played uh, by Bobby Fischer. Um, I think it was Burn against Fischer. So uh, Bobby Fischer was playing as black. And it was black to move. There's a really nice move. See if you can pause and find this one. All right, well, if you had a chance to look at that, maybe you noticed uh, when you looked at this position, but black's queen is under attack. And what's amazing about this position is that Bobby Fischer said, I don't really care. And he played the move bishop to e6. He allowed his queen to be captured. Why did he do that? Because after the queen gets captured, he took on c4 with check. Notice the rook here forces the king to go over. And then he played knight to e2 check. And it's kind of a type of windmill, but with a knight instead of a rook, right? And it's not even in the corner. It's kind of in a different situation. But the same idea applies that... He can move his knight basically wherever he wants to because he has check with the bishop, okay? So he captured here, unleashed the check, the king went back, he went back, and then he went over to c3 because why not? He's got the time to do it. He relocated it where he wanted his knight to be, and then he took back this bishop, okay? And it's actually a, a totally winning position for black. Um, he got the bishop on c4. He got the bishop on b6. He got an extra pawn. So he got two bishops and a pawn for the queen but on top of that, White's king is in big trouble. The rook is out of the game. Black's pieces are just so awesome that this is a crushing position, and he went on to win. So uh, just wanted to show you those, those last couple you know, games. They do show up in regular games, and you can see how from this position here, you might think there's no way in the world a windmill tactic even matters, but that's not true, and we saw a good example of why uh, in, you know, in this game. So hope you guys learned something and enjoyed that. As always, I'll see you next time. Stay sharp, play smart, and take care.